Welcome to the Blockchain VC, a podcast about crypto and the digital assets ecosystem. My name is Tomer Federman, and I'm the managing partner at Federman Capital. We invest in the most promising blockchain startups across the globe. I have more than 15 years of experience in tech, and before starting the fund, I was on the product side at Facebook, where I led product strategy and global growth of some of Facebook's major ad products. Previously, I also lived in Silicon Valley for a few years, where I attended Stanford Business School. You can find me on Twitter at Tomer Federman. Before we begin, please note that this podcast is for informational purposes only, and all the opinions expressed on this show, either by guests or me, do not reflect the opinions of Federman Capital. Nothing on the Blockchain VC podcast represents an investment or financial advice. Please, do your own research. Also, If you like this episode of The Blockchain VC and want to help us bring more awareness to the space, I'd really appreciate it if you can rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast. This only takes a few seconds and helps us get the word out. Okay, let's do this. So really excited to welcome to the show today, Jameson Lopp and the CTO of Casa. Jameson, thanks a lot for coming on the show. No problem. Glad to be here. So maybe to get started, Jameson, um, you're one of the, I think, most uh, well-known people in the space. And um, would love to hear more about kind of your background and how you became interested in crypto and blockchain to begin with. Uh, so I got involved in Bitcoin a number of years ago. I was just interested in it uh, mainly from a computer science standpoint. Um, I... I heard about it a number of times you know over the years and was always dismissing it because I figured you know it was some system that was going to get hacked and everybody was going to lose their money but after it kept coming back over and over I, I finally realized that it wasn't dying off and that I should probably look into it so once I actually read the white paper and I realized that it was doing some interesting things on the computer science side it also piqued my interest from a sort of philosophical viewpoint because I figured that you know if money is this abstract concept that kind of belongs to humanity then it makes sense that the definition and development of money ought to be an open project where anyone who cares can uh, contribute to it right and the um... Was it immediately obvious to you when you started looking into it that this thing could be so transformative? Uh, I mean, I definitely thought it was an interesting development. You know, once I read the white paper, it wasn't obvious that it was going to work incredibly well, which is why I you know went ahead and actually got some Bitcoin so I could actually play around with it and see it work. And You know it was once I actually started using it and you know was able to exchange it for other goods and services and and realize that you know this was a new type of of payment system that could not really be censored that's when I really started to see the value in it got it makes sense um, and when was that like when did you start when did you read the white paper and became a uh... more interested in the space uh, that was back in 2012 and and I spent a few years just as sort of a hobbyist um, you know talking about it and reading the forums and discussing with people and then after I had been interested in it for three years or so that's when I decided that I wanted to go ahead and, and work in the space full time you know a bunch of venture capital had been Been coming into the space uh, and that's when I started working for bitgo doing uh, basically infrastructure engineering for their enterprise multi-sig security wallet and um, I had I had been doing some other projects just on the side uh, open source stuff trying to better understand how Bitcoin worked but that's when I went uh, sort of head first and and was really you living and, and breathing Bitcoin 24/7 ever since then one thing I was curious about is you know obviously with bitgo and more recently now with uh, casa seems like you're pretty focused on solving custody and key management and how people protect their crypto assets and Bitcoin in particular 
why is that? Like, is that something that you think is particularly interesting in the space? Obviously, there's a lot going on. Why did you decide to focus on that uh, segment of the market? You know, it's not necessarily the most interesting uh, thing going on, but I think that it is a fundamental issue that is still not fully solved. Um, basically, I, I think that the, you know, the easy solution where people could just sort of throw up their hands and give up is to just, you know, give your private keys to a trusted third party and, and allow them to custody your funds. But I find that to be very unpalatable because then we're just recreating the banking system, you know, with a new layer of infrastructure underneath it. So, you know, the, the, the promise that Bitcoin allows you to be your own bank, in my opinion, is not yet fully fulfilled because while it is technically possible to be your own bank and it always has been the, the level of like sophistication and the, the, the high learning curve required in order to do that well has prevented a lot of people from doing it, or a lot of people who have done it have ended up uh, shooting themselves in the foot and losing access to their private keys. So I think that this is a, a fundamental unsolved problem in Bitcoin and that you know we're never going to realize the dream of a uh, you know, fully distributed uh, financial system if it's not easy for the average person to hold their own funds securely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I have actually been hearing more and more recently, I think a lot of people in the space um, think that in a way, custody is a solved problem at this point, right? Because you have all these companies, you know, whether it's Coinbase or Fidelity are now entering the space or BitGo, you know, Kingdom Trust and so forth, who are off offering a regulated um, custody solution, oftentimes now also with an insurance plan. But I, I completely hear you. What you're saying is that's that's not really why we got into this space to begin with. Yeah, I mean, it's to me, it's incredibly boring and a cop out and it um it recreates a lot of the systemic risk where sure you can make arguments that you know highly respected and and secure companies with lots of experts are now custodying private keys for people but if if you're concentrating the holdings of large portions of the system in a small number of actors it it doesn't really matter how secure they are against your average threats you're still creating honeypots for either sophisticated attackers or for uh if you you want to go to the extreme nation state attackers uh and you know in this in this system um you know it it was kind of born and developed out of um, almost a, a level of of paranoia and, and adversarial thinking but we do want to build a system that is robust against any conceivable attack, even if it's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and is that also what prompted you to more recently make the move from BitGo to Casa? Yeah, so the the three years that I spent at BitGo, I was working on you know non custodial multi sig solutions where you know BitGo would have one out of three keys, but we were never actually uh, fully custodying anyone's funds. As I was leaving, BitGo was starting to spool up uh, a custody solution, which they're now also offering, um, which is you know a, a completely different system actually, but. Um, I switched over to Casa. It was it was a very small pivot for me on the technical side because it's it's also a multi sig non custodial type of solution. The main difference is that Bitgo is specifically targeting enterprise customers, and at Casa we're targeting individuals. So. I felt that this was actually a personal problem that I had been dealing with the entire time I had been in Bitcoin, where I spend one to two days every year basically refreshing my uh, cold storage setup, making sure that everything's up to date and is, is still usable. 
And if it takes me that long to do it, then I could very easily see how the vast majority of people would not bother to go to that extreme. And so I wanted to build a solution that was as robust against both attacks and uh, accidental losses as the system that I had already set up for myself, but that was, you know, much more easy to use and that the average person could, could easily follow along with. So, you know, there were various options out there, guides like the Glacier Protocol, uh, but that uh, is even more complicated than my own solution that I had set up. So we managed to build a, a very user-friendly solution that is easy to use because it's just a mobile app interface. But on the back end, we're leveraging a lot of the security features from hardware devices that are already out there on the market and uh, making it very easy for people to visualize and uh, update basically the, the health of their own vault setup with these multiple different hardware devices that are geographically distributed. Interesting. I mean, I, I think you can also make the case that solving for the end users or I guess the long tail of, you know, users is arguably a more difficult problem to solve um, as opposed to solving, you know, custody for large institutions who may have more resources behind them and are more sophisticated in nature. Yes, and it's it's hard to sell security. So, you know, BitGo, I think, made the right decision early on in targeting uh, other businesses because, you know, these exchanges and payment processors that are probably custodying millions, if not tens of millions of dollars uh, worth of Bitcoin, they have a lot to lose and it's not actually their money. So they, they, they have an incentive to uh, pay in order to have better security and not lose other people's money. Whereas when you're talking about mm -hmm. the individual, uh, the, the average individual does not really think that way. Uh, we're, we're not really used to paying very much for security. I mean, you might have an alarm on your house or something, but in general, we're more used to paying for insurance, which will you know reimburse us after the fact. We don't really think about paying for security to prevent the bad things from happening in the first place. Right, right. So, so I guess like how for for people who are listening to this episode and are not familiar with Casa, what is Casa? Sure. So, at a very high level, our motto is to help improve personal sovereignty. That's a very broad uh, mantra for us to to sort of operate under. But the way that we're starting out approaching that is by helping people manage their private keys and helping people manage um, their their full nodes and basically acting as uh, you know fully validating entities on the Bitcoin network because that also gives you the best security posture. So we have a couple of different products that we've released over the past few years, the first of which was our key master product and that is, the uh, multi-sig self-custody vault solution. Uh, we've got uh, both a three of five multi-sig and a two of three multi-sig, uh, several different tiers based upon you know the value that you are trying to protect and uh, you know how much effort you are willing to go to. You know how how distributed you want your keys to be and how redundant against various uh, loss and failure scenarios. And in fact, we just released about a 50-page uh, PDF that is our wealth security protocol that goes into all of the details of the decisions that we made around these different uh, multi-sig tiers and the attacks and uh, mitigations for those attacks that, that each of our products uh, helps protect you against. Now, the, the other thing that we released about a year ago was our CASA node, which is this plug-and-play Bitcoin and Lightning node. It's uh, it's basically a Raspberry Pi platform with a lot of custom software that we've developed. And the idea is that you just plug it into your network and your power, and it's very easy to set up and uh, deposit some Bitcoin onto, which will then uh, be input into the Lightning node to create channels and allow you to send and receive payments on Lightning. Uh, originally, 
This was only really accessible through your web browser when you were on your home network for security reasons. And then over the past few months, what we've done is uh, create a few other pieces of software that make it possible for you to access your node from anywhere in the world securely uh, over Tor. That uh, those things are the the Casa browser extension, and then more recently the Sats app, which is an, another mobile app, which is very easy for you to connect to your node just by scanning a QR code and inputting your password. So that now you're able to to send you know Lightning payments from from anywhere globally uh, to other people on the Lightning network or other people uh, who have uh, Sats app usernames. And you can do that all over Tor while uh, still actually using your own node that is running back at your home or wherever you put it. So kind of what you can see is we're, we're, we're creating this ecosystem of products where we are helping users help themselves to be sovereign uh, currently from a financial standpoint. But over the long term, we want to help people be sovereign from many different standpoints, uh, including you know, having full control over their own data, full control over their own digital identity, and, and really any other sort of uh, decentralized and distributed protocols that come out that help empower people to, you know, take back the power from the trusted third parties and basically run their own services in a way that is uh, censorship resistant. Right. Um, there's a lot there. So um, I'd like to try to unpack it a bit and um, maybe starting actually with one of the things you mentioned towards the end, I read through your uh, wealth security protocol that you released recently and um, one of the things I really like about it and appreciate about it is, like you said, you basically walk people through your reasoning for making, you know, a bunch of decisions there. Why, why did you think it's important to, to, to share that? Because um, I think it's quite unique. Um, and I, you know, personally really appreciated that. But I don't see many companies who you know, release a 50 page PDF explaining why they made a bunch of different design, usability, security decisions. Curious what prompted that. Well, it's actually a natural result of the conversations that we've ended up having over the past couple of years is, you know, what we found is that a lot of our high end users who have millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin that they want to keep secure and don't want to trust to third parties, uh, these tend to be more sophisticated users. And, and, and they, on the whole, do not want to just blindly trust Casa that, you know, uh, we have a good solution because of my reputation or anyone else's reputation who is working at Casa. Uh, we, we ended up having what we found to be a lot of very similar conversations with these new users, you know, during the sales process. Uh, these are the types of questions that would come up. Uh, they would basically want to know, you know, what happens if X happens? You know, how do I recover from failure Z? And um, it, it, it just became a lot more efficient for us to, uh, you know, formalize all of the questions and answers that, that we were seeing on a regular basis so that we could just give people this document rather than piecemeal having, uh, you know, one-off conversations with people. And, and once again, it, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier, that it's very hard to sell security to people. Um, this, this type of document helps people understand that we're not just claiming to be secure. We're, we're actually, mm -hmm. we're showing our proof of work that we have worked through all of these possible uh, failure scenarios. And we, we have built a solution that can mitigate against almost all of them. Now, the ultimate, uh, I guess, problem with any self custody solution is that there always will be a a path to failure where because the user is in control, they can make enough mistakes that they uh, lose access to their funds. And really what our job is at CASA is to try to build you know, guide rails within our, our software, within the processes uh, that the, the actual wallet follows to try to 
prevent users from going off on any of the paths, the sort of decision trees that can lead to failure. But ultimately, uh, you know, we can't prevent someone from making enough mistakes, you know, if they're not following our guidance, if they're not following the, the, the software uh, and and the warnings that we're displaying to them. But uh, we try to make it as bulletproof as possible. Right. Um, one of the other things I really like about your approach, um, I know you've mentioned previously the emphasis that you put not just on security, but also on uh, usability and, and trying to make it as intuitive as possible for user to start, users to start using CASA uh, without necessarily having deep technical knowledge. Yes, I mean the, the the goal is really to you know make it as easy to use as any other mobile application. So we have a great team of designers, and they have made it very easy for you to visualize your security basically all on one screen uh, on the mobile app, and then you can dig into. The, the different uh, key sets and different devices that are helping secure your funds. And you can you know, perform health checks. You can even perform uh, rotations of, of devices. You know, if, if a device breaks, you just go buy another one off the shelf, plug it in, and click through the wizard that we have in our software there. Uh, one of the unique things, actually, about CASA's uh, key master is that we have actually eliminated the need for the user to keep the backup seed phrases stored. And we, we actually found that this was very important to help better understand the security model because when a user sets up a new hardware device like a Trezor or a Ledger or cold card, what have you, you know, it, it gives you this 24 word seed phrase and says, you know, write this down and keep it safe. And there's just an entire mountain of like IT and security knowledge that is contained within that sentence that gets completely glossed over. And what we found is that when we were trying to reason about the security model, it became impossible for us to reason about the security model if we had no idea what was going on with these seed phrases. And so we, we figure, you know, if the user is writing down the seed phrase and then could be doing absolutely anything with it. They could be leaving it out in the open. They could, you know, uh, put it somewhere where someone else sees it and throws it away because they think it's trash. Um, it just became impossible for us to to fully uh, be confident in you know a multi sig setup where you have basically the exposed private keys floating around who knows where. Um, right, that fits the purpose of the whole product. Exactly. And, and, and we, th we also, we, we basically said to ourselves, you know, if, if everyone agrees that users should not be managing private keys directly, I mean, that's why we have hardware devices, you know, specialized hardware to do that, then why is it okay for us to just give the seed phrase in an unencrypted format to the user? Because that is all of the private keys right there on a piece of paper. And it just, you know, it, it didn't really make sense to us. And so when we figured out that, we could actually get rid of the the need to store the seed phrases by having a more flexible system uh, in in the multi sig uh, setup where you can basically rotate out a lost device. That uh, I think was one of the major advancements that we made just in the, the security model in general. Absolutely, I, I I think that's really important. Actually, one of our uh, thesis is you know crypto can't really scale you know much more before we actually solve the private key issue, right? Like writing down a seed phrase or a private key or whatever it is and, you know, storing it at the safe or maybe not, it, it just, it's not going to work. Not, not just because it feels very clunky and, you know, prone to hacking, but also because of what you said earlier and maybe even more likely people will just forget about it and won't know where they left it or, you know, and then they just lose access to their funds. Um, so on Keymaster specifically, um, so when you said earlier two to three and, you know, you talked about three to five, basically what that means, got me if I'm wrong, in the three to five uh, case, you only need three out of the five um, keys that you get in order to unlock access to your funds. But each one of the keys on their own is basically worthless. 
and then you can rotate between them if you lost access to one of the keys. Correct. So in the three of five setup, uh, you'll have one key that is on your mobile phone secured by the secure element that's in the hardware on uh, your Android or, or iOS device. Um, you will then have three hardware devices, you know, Trezor, Ledger, Cold Card, uh, what have you. And those will be in geographically separated locations. And then the final key is held offline by CASA as a sort of extreme disaster uh, recovery uh, scenario. So in normal operation, if you lose your phone or you change phones or it breaks or any of your other three hardware devices get lost, stolen, or stop functioning for any reason, then you can just go into the Keymaster app, click on that device, and say, hey, I need to replace this. Go buy a new one, and we will uh, walk you through the process of basically sweeping the funds from the current set of keys and sending them to your new set of keys, which will be the, the same four out of five, but only one new uh, key set. And and so that gives users a level of flexibility where you know they can basically re-secure themselves without ever having to call up CASA uh, or bother support. Now, if you lose two devices at the exact same time, then you get into a situation where you have to uh, go through the CASA-assisted recovery process and will... Uh, need to do some additional authentication to make sure that you're not under duress and that, you know, nothing fishy is going on. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we set up, uh, some of the, the processes, you know, beforehand with the user of, you know, how long do we put a sort of a freeze on this process? You know, it's usually three to five days, but it can be longer, uh, whatever the user wants, you know, before CASA will actually, uh, sign off um, on a recovery transaction with our uh, key that we're keeping in cold storage. And so in general, this three of five setup seems to be incredibly robust against all of the, the factors that we outline in our paper. And we have ended up releasing the two of three multi-sig, which is not as robust, but it's uh, simpler and we, we price it uh, a lot lower where basically Anyone who buys our, our gold level package for $300 a year will get that uh, two of three set up along with the plug and play node and uh, hardware device and probably a, a few other things. Um, uh, let's see, we also have like a Faraday bag for you to, to keep your uh, hardware device in. But uh, the idea being there that, you know, we want to get people using our system and understanding uh how user friendly it is in the hopes that you know over the long term as bitcoin continues to grow and become worth more that uh you know people will find that they're very happy with their current setup and that if they get to the point where they are uh, securing a much larger amount of value then they may be interested in upgrading to uh, the higher security higher uh key set mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah, and and how important is it to use um, a, a different hardware wallets as part of this process? So you mentioned, you know, Ledger, Trezor, so forth. Can I just use, you know, two or three different Trezor, or, or is your recommendation to diversify there as well to reduce risk? Yeah, so the entire point of of everything that we have set up is to eliminate single points of failure. Uh, we don't want CASA to be a single point of failure. We don't want any of these hardware device makers to be a single point of failure. We don't want Apple or Google or any of the phone makers to be a single point of failure. So that is why we recommend using a diverse set of manufacturers basically to uh, prevent supply chain attacks because no one is actually going to go in and audit the hardware. I mean, that's an insane proposition that requires a level of resources that pretty much nobody is willing to, to go to uh, the expenditure to do. And so if you, if you figure that, hey, I'm, I'm spreading out my keys both geographically and digitally, you know, and uh, across a number of different companies and different hardware and software, then the likelihood that enough of those 
uh, different companies have all colluded or have all been exploited by the same actor and will be able to, you know, work in concert against me simultaneously, it becomes incredibly low. And, and that is really about the best, uh, guarantee that you can get in this space. You know, there's no 100% guarantees. It's all kind of about, uh, probability and, uh, thresholds for risk. Right. Right. Makes sense. And then, um, um, you talked about the assisted recovery in the unlikely case that you lose access to two devices pretty much at the same time. Um, can, can you expand a bit more about how that works? I mean, when I sign up, do I need to provide a lot of details about myself so that in the unlikely event that I do need to go through the assisted recovery process, you can verify that I am who I claim I am? Or how do you do that? Yes, this is where it gets interesting because of our uh, privacy protection. Uh, we're, we're very keen on avoiding getting to the point where we do any sort of AML or KYC level identity verification. So it, it actually is customized for each user based upon what level of information they are comfortable with giving. So, you know, some people will. Um, give us like a, a selfie and uh, do like a video call with us so that, you know, we can have that level of, of detail, but um, it is definitely not required that you give us your real name or, or even, uh, you know, photo or, or anything else like that. Um, if a customer is more privacy conscious and we have plenty who are, uh, who basically give us, you know, uh, uh, but a throwaway like proton mail email address that they created specifically for this purpose and they they never interact with us using their real name then we have other options where uh basically we can use other forms of authentication like uh, recovery questions we have a whole bank of questions that we've developed that are not your standard type of questions like they should be things that are not uh publicly known um and, uh, you know, you can also do other types of uh, photo authentication where, you know, you take a photo of, you know, some object that is personal to you that, you know, you may have in your possession or in your house or whatever, but no one else would know that, you know, that is something that you would use for authentication purposes. So at the, at the, the higher like platinum and, and diamond tier levels where we have users that are securing millions of dollars, you know, we have what is almost like a, a white glove uh, concierge level of service where we, we are customizing a lot of things uh, basically to suit each user. And ultimately, the, the, the final like tier of customization and where it gets really complicated, and this is something that we're still working on, um, but basically the next extension of the CASA wealth security protocol is the CASA inheritance protocol. And that is, you know, another thing that a lot of users have talked to us about, you know, they're, they're interested in having a setup where they can be confident that it's not only robust against attack and robust against loss, but they also want to be confident that in the case that uh, they, you know, pass suddenly, that they their heirs will be able to access the funds and you know this is where it gets really customized and really complicated because you know everybody's uh, personal family situation is different uh, people live in different jurisdictions that have different estate laws and so uh, we've been spent pretty much most of this year uh, working on the inheritance protocol as well trying to come up with a a general guide that is also customizable based upon each user's needs. And we're currently in the sort of beta testing process of, of having some customers go through that and give us feedback. Yeah, I, I can imagine that's a whole new challenge in itself, inheritance, and how do you, how do you solve for that? So it sounds like the system that you're offering is very flexible and customized to each user and their own needs. Definitely. One thing also I wanted to ask you about the about Keymaster is you talked about you know using your mobile device. 
What about desktop support? And, and do you think that mobile is more secure inherently than desktop? Yeah, so it, uh, it's, it can get complicated to evaluate the uh, security of any given device. Uh, in general, I would say that mobile devices are more secure than desktops. Um, and specifically, we, we, we actually have a, a big issue with a lot of services that are browser-based. Um, we've been uh, researching you know, how easy it is for you know, malicious browser extensions to uh, screw around with web-based services. But the problem with, with desktops is that they have a much larger attack surface. It's much easier to get uh, malware and and basically exploits that will affect your uh, your desktop. Uh, you know, one of the most common ones that we've seen in uh, in the crypto space is actually the uh, clipboard hijacker malware that will actually uh, swap out crypto addresses that you copy and paste uh, for addresses that belong to attackers. And um, while you know it is possible. To get malware on your phone, the just the nature of the fact that the iOS and Android operating systems tend to sandbox the applications uh, much better than what happens in on like Windows, for example, uh, it does give you a a much stronger security posture, and um, and in general, I mean, we we find that you know developing for the mobile platform is just easier uh, to get a uh, a more consistent user experience got it and then w- what's behind your decision to focus on you know on bitcoin and uh, so far not to expand to support other um, other tokens beyond that like ethereum and so forth yeah, that's actually mostly based upon my experience that I had at BitGo, uh, where uh, the the last year that I worked at BitGo, we overhauled a lot of our infrastructure to make it more generic and make it easier to add in uh, support for all kinds of other uh, tokens and crypto assets. And, uh, and personally, what I found, at least uh, for me, was that we, we ended up adding a ton of complexity uh, by adding all of these other assets. And it's really hard to justify the return on investment. Um, our infrastructure became an operational nightmare to manage. Um, I, I, I think I wrote a few blog posts and gave a few presentations about how much more challenging I found uh, Ethereum infrastructure uh, to keep running compared to Bitcoin. And... Um, when you when you go in and you actually look at you know the value that is being stored and transacted on these other networks i mean it just it falls off so quickly and you know there's such a long tail of assets that while sure uh you you could argue that we're losing out on some potential revenue um it's it's ultimately so much smaller relative to bitcoin that the the technical complexity that you end up adding uh, it's it's hard for me to justify and when i look at how much progress we've made over the past couple of years but still how much more work i would like for us to get done just on bitcoin um it's it, it kind of pains me to think about how many things we would have to forego uh, adding support for on bitcoin if we started adding other assets Hmm. That's, that's really interesting. I guess one of the, I could see that pretty much for every other, I guess, crypto asset, but in the Ethereum case, I guess, when you think about the ELC20 ecosystem and how many of these, you know, how many crypto projects are built on top of um, Ethereum. Uh, that's that's a really interesting decision. Well, there's also the security aspect uh, when it comes to multisig. Um, and I also uh, have spoken about this, but the there's an inherent problem with Ethereum because they don't have native multi-sig functionality. You actually have to run a smart contract that has multi-sig functionality that is built into the contract. And 
This is something that BitGo spent, I think, a year and a half developing a multi-sig smart contract and had it audited three or four times. And and basically every audit kept finding problems that uh, could have been catastrophic. And, you know, it, it seems to be a little bit better now. I think the uh, a lot of the standardization has kind of fallen around the uh, Gnosis uh, multi-sig smart contract. I'm not sure if anyone else is using uh, BitGo's multi-sig smart contract, but we just we saw multiple catastrophic failures with uh, smart contracts in Ethereum because it is, I believe, deceptively easy to write smart contracts in Ethereum, but uh, deceptively uh, difficult and complicated to write secure smart contracts. So, you know, there were a few examples. Uh, I believe uh, Parity, for example, had a multi-sig smart contract that basically got attacked and broken and uh, forget how many tens of millions of dollars were uh, pretty much frozen forever as a result of one simple bug. And that's just the kind of security nightmares that keep me up at night. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Can you talk, Jameson, a bit about your nodes? And I guess the basic question is, why should an end user even run a node? Like what's the, what's behind this? Why is it important? And why one of your very first products? Yeah. And I've, I've written a number of articles about this because it's a common question. Uh, People basically say, you know, why should I run a node? It's not paying me anything like I would get paid if I was mining, for example, Uh, what is my incentive to run a node? And The incentive is actually quite clear. It is not a direct financial payment incentive, but rather it is a security posture incentive where if if you are running a full node and full is short for fully validating, then you are in the strongest uh, security um, model that Bitcoin has to offer. And that is the the model that is often referred to as trustless. Uh, but it is at the very it is at the very least trust minimized because you are not trusting that anyone else on the network is being honest to you because you are going out and talking to peers on the network, you're asking them for data, and then you're validating the data that you receive. And if you receive invalid data, then you basically block the the peer that sent you invalid data and you don't uh, trust them to send you anything anymore. So, you know, why is this important? Well, it kind of goes back to the whole uh, you know, decentralization and censorship resistance uh, philosophy that the network was was founded upon, which is that, if you're if you're connecting to a trusted third party to tell you the truth about your transactions and balances, then sure you might be a little bit better off if you're still maintaining your private keys, but you're once again recreating a, a sort of bank like system where you're you're creating choke points where third parties could be lying to you. And you know, why why would we want to do that when we don't have to? Um, now, obviously, for a lot of people, running a node seems like uh, too much work or you know requires too much technical knowledge, but that's exactly why we created the Casa node is because we believe that it should be as simple as plugging something into your, your router and your uh, electrical wall jack and then uh, using other software to basically make use of the full node. So I often describe a full node as it kind of acts as a sentinel uh, on your behalf. It is making sure that nobody is breaking the rules on the network. And it's, it's doing this 24 seven, 365. And, you know, it's basically acting uh, as your own personal auditor. And as long as you can keep the, that computer running, then you can be assured that no one is trying to uh, defraud you, at least at the protocol level. Mm-hmm. And then what happens if, I, um, for some reason, I unplug the node? Uh, maybe there is even, you know, I lost electricity in my house or something. Uh, I, am I at any risk if temporarily I unplug the node? 
Not really. Uh, the the biggest problem that that comes into play uh, with having your node go offline for an extended period of time is if you're uh, running on the Lightning network. Um, you could run into problems if your node is offline for more than several days at a time. And this is where we start getting into the area of, of research around what is being called watchtowers, uh, where you can have um, other nodes on the network essentially that are uh, watching out for transactions that are trying to defraud you and, and basically stopping those from, uh, from stealing your money if you go offline for a long period of time. Uh, but you know that's a a bit more complicated to get into, uh, and watchtowers are still in the early days. Uh, we there is watchtower software available, but is not yet widespread use. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and what's next for Casa? Do you see yourself, for instance, going beyond Raspberry Pi, and um, like? What's your vision moving forward? Yes, yeah, so we want to do a lot more than just Bitcoin and Lightning, like I said, which which is going to require uh, faster, beefier hardware. Though we're going to want to keep it all in a small form factor. You know, we don't want to have to ship out desktop size computers to people. But um, you know, this hardware is continuing to improve. Uh, we're actually uh, currently working on the next uh, minor iteration in the hardware, which is just going to swap it out for the Raspberry Pi 4, which is already much faster than the, the three that the current uh, Casa Node is based upon. And in fact, it's fast enough that we will no longer have to ship the blockchain pre-synced, which means you'll you'll get the, uh, the node and within uh, one to two days of turning it on, it will have fully verified the entire history of the Bitcoin blockchain uh, there at your house or wherever you put it. But looking further out uh, you know, to next year and beyond, uh, we, we are most likely going to end up doing more customized hardware that is even more performant and, and hopefully will get us even greater uh, you know, uh, savings of, of manufacturing at scale. Uh, this, this first device has been, you know, all off the shelf parts and hand assembled by us. And if we can continue to keep ramping up production and actually getting to at least some like medium scale manufacturing level, then we can, we can start uh, reducing our costs a lot and be able to do more customized stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would like to see, but um, I do hope that, you know, in a year or so we'll be able to put out a more customized uh, board that is also going to have, you know, more customized case and uh, a lot more processing power that we'll be able to run a variety of different services we we kind of anticipate uh, having almost like an app store itself within the casa node of you know do you want to run a uh, uh, like a data f file storage you know distributed dropbox type of setup or uh, do you want to run your own you know btc pay server for commerce purposes or who knows uh you know, some people have even expressed interest in running their own email server, though I know from personal experience that that can be a nightmare. But, you know, these are all the type of things that we're going to continue experimenting with. That's fascinating. Like you said, I think earlier, there's just so much ahead. So really curious to see what you do next. But one more question on that, just before we, I do want to ask you also a couple of questions um, about the market more broadly. Um but one more question about that. I'm uh, curious about your view on, you know, MPC technology and the uh, threshold cryptographic. Have, have you looked into that? And um, do you see that as something that uh, you're going to build on top of uh, in the future? Uh, so, you know, multi-party computation stuff, uh, are, are you specifically referring to, like, the, the setups that are being used for various ZK snarks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the the whole area of zero knowledge stuff seems to be moving really quickly right now. So it's definitely something that I'm keeping an eye on, though, you know, when it comes to security, you, you often don't want to implement the freshest, uh, you know, most cutting edge stuff. You, you actually want to implement the things that have been around for a number of years and have been attacked 
and attacked and, you know, withstood a ton of attacks. So this is the type of thing where, unfortunately, I have to say, you know, time will tell uh, because we, we, because kind of like I said earlier, there are no real guarantees. It's, it's once again, one of those things where the longer something has withstood the test of time, the more confident that we are that there are no lingering major exploits out there. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So kind of focusing on the tried and tested. Um, as I think many proponents of Bitcoin argue, Bitcoin has been around for you know over 10 years now and has been tested certainly to a certain degree more than uh, any other uh, crypto asset out, out there. So I can definitely see how that applies to security even more so. So, so kind of shifting gears a bit, I do, as I said, want to ask you a couple of questions about uh, the market more broadly. What's What's your view on the status of the Lightning Network and the pace of scaling um, of the network so far? Well, it's definitely grown a lot over the past year. The The kind of awkward thing is that as Lightning Network continues to be improved on the privacy side, it actually becomes more and more difficult for us to visualize uh, the the growth of the network like it's already impossible for us to actually know how many transactions happen on the network and it's becoming more and more difficult for us to even know how many nodes or how many channels are on the network and it's actually by design so while it's hard to to actually look at the network itself uh, we have to then kind of look at second order of effects of, you know, how many services are hooking into the network, how many different people are talking about using the network. And uh, that is something where I think there has been some progress made, but one of the most important missing pieces that I think is uh, going to have to happen for Lightning Network to really grow and become more usable is we need to get the exchanges onto the Lightning Network. And at this point, I'm only really aware of, uh, I think Bitstamp has said that they're uh, experimenting with it, but um, I don't think any of the major exchanges have actually added it yet as an option. And, and that's important just to, again, increase the volume and the number of transactions that are happening on, on top of Lightning. Well, and it's important from a liquidity standpoint. Uh, I wrote an article, I think about three years ago now, where I actually showed some simulations of uh, sort of channel rebalancing and liquidity management, where I believe that is it's incredibly important that uh, people should be able to uh, get inbound liquidity to their node via paying you know out of band in some other fashion by which i mean you know if if you have a bunch of channels on your lightning node and uh, they get imbalanced and they can potentially become unusable for either sending or, or receiving depending on which way the channel is imbalanced then you want to somehow rebalance that channel to avoid having to close it and reopen it with on-chain right. transactions and if you can reach out to some other liquidity provider on the network, uh, one example right now would be BitRefill. I think they do something like this uh, with uh, Thor and some of their other Lightning services. But if you were able to just go to your exchange where you already have an account and you know uh, basically uh, send them money uh, through a traditional financial network, then they could send you the money over Lightning to, to rebalance that. And this is, I believe, going to be one of the greatest challenges uh, over the long term with the Lightning Network. It's not going to be so much the uh, security or the privacy engineering, but I think it's actually going to be the engineering of, um, of managing the liquidity and doing that in as automated a fashion as possible. Uh, one, one of the things that I've been saying quite a bit is that I don't believe that Lightning Network is going to be able to be a mainstream thing as long as the user has to understand what channels are. I, I, I kind of look into the mm. future and when I, when I try to envision what the um, optimal Lightning wallet would look like, it would just be a Bitcoin wallet. 
you wouldn't even necessarily know that it's using lightning. The software itself should be figuring out automatically whether to do something on chain or off chain and how to manage all the, the channels under the hood and how to do channel rebalancing and, and, and seek out uh, liquidity providers and all of that stuff. So the, that's where I think a lot of the coding and a lot of the uh, uh, research is actually going to need to take place over the next few years. Right. All right. And when, what do you say to, to critics who, you know, claim that the hub and spoke model of lightning could actually generate quite a bit of centralization? Uh, that is actually something that I addressed in that article, uh, like three years ago, which seems to be holding true, uh, which is that we are going to see a kind of, uh, power law of, you know, liquidity providers where you would expect that the large enterprises like the exchanges and payment processors are going to have the largest presence on the lightning network. And then, you know, you'll have some medium to small other retail businesses that will also uh, have a decent amount of liquidity. And then you'll have all the individuals uh, who are just, you know, interested in making the occasional payment, but they're not going to be receiving a ton of payments. And so this will create uh, uh, a graph that to some people looks highly centralized, but ultimately the the question is not, you know, what does the network graph look like? The real question is, is it censorship resistant? And so if you had a hub and spoke model where there were only a handful of hubs and everyone had no real choice but to connect to those hubs, then you would have lost the censorship resistance there. But in Lightning Network, that's not the case. I mean, you can connect to almost any other node on the network that is you know, making itself publicly available. So you can always route around the hubs if they become bad actors. And uh, you know, this is one of the, the things where um, I don't think it's possible for me to prove uh, that it's impossible for, for Lightning to turn into a hub-and-spoke network. But, you know, we can continue looking at the, the network graphs and, and see pretty clearly that it is, it is not today. And I, I, I find it highly unlikely that it will turn into that. And I am actively fighting against that by, you know, making uh, plug and play node hardware and software so that the individuals can uh, be a part of this network mesh on their own. Right, right. Makes sense. Um, and speaking of the market, curious for... Curious about your views on, you know, we've recently seen Bucked uh, launch, much anticipated, I think. Um, any, any thoughts on that? How important is that to the ecosystem, to the crypto ecosystem overall? Maybe you see even a potential collaboration with Casa moving forward? Uh, so far, we've generally stayed away from any institutional stuff uh, because once you get to a really large level and you start being regulated, uh, we, we probably don't want to have anything to do with that. We want to, you know, remain a, a pure uh, software provider. But um, I don't know. You know, it, it's it's been so many years now with people talking about, you know, quote unquote, institutional interest coming into Bitcoin that uh, I don't even really worry about it or think about it very much. Um, personally, I, I don't want like institutions to to get into bitcoin super early because i want the individuals to to be able to get into bitcoin super early and uh you know reap all of the benefits of that themselves but um you know institutions are, are free to do as they please at least within the confines of their regulatory framework but um it's not really something that i think is going to make or break bitcoin itself and and i think if you just kind of look at what I've been working on and what I focus on, uh, you know, I, I care more about the individuals. Right. Right. So the, the end user, the individual who is learning about the space and wants to get involved. So last question before we end uh, Jameson, your emphasis, I guess, on personal privacy has been well documented the New York Times ran an article about it earlier this year. One thing that really caught my eye was you mentioned that these days you're working remotely 
and don't really join meetings in person. Um, and that's something that's really interesting to me because I always tend to think that there's a lot of value just from my own experience building products. There was a lot of value to a team being at the same location. You know, oftentimes it just fosters innovation and casual conversations can lead to new ideas. Curious if you can share more about your experience working remotely and, and, and do you think it is better than, you know, being in person in, in the same location with, with the team? Or, may, or maybe there are, you know, multiple locations, but the idea of, you know, centralized locations, I guess, for teams. Right. So I've been working remotely for almost four years. Um, I certainly don't miss commuting. Uh, from a from a like a, a team building standpoint, uh, there is something important about uh, having this natural like background noise, like as people are collaborating and you know cross pollination, overhearing you know people talking about things that you may have not learn about otherwise mm -hmm. and actually something that we we did at bitgo that i uh have also brought over to casa is the idea that you can actually kind of simulate or recreate some of that by having a persistent video conference on in the background so you know as people may want to just chat about one one small thing or another, they can actually do it on the video conference and you still have the ability to overhear that. And if there's something interesting where you uh, want to get clarification or you want to get your put your own input into, then uh, you can actually do that over the, the video conference. Or if it's just getting annoying, you can you can mute it, which is not necessarily an option if you're actually in the office. Right. Interesting. So that's that's something I haven't, I don't think I've heard before. So basically like ongoing video conferencing rather than scheduling a video conference for a specific meeting. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah, because I find that scheduling meetings and all of that, that just, you know, it becomes so formal that sometimes you just have these casual conversations where, yeah, you, you didn't even necessarily think about some of these ideas before and then they just come up as you're having lunch or you know talking between meetings but uh, hmm, interesting well thanks a lot uh, Jameson for, for coming on the show it really has been a pleasure talking with you thanks for having me thanks for listening if you like this episode of the blockchain VC and want to help us bring more awareness to the space I'd really appreciate it if you can rate review and subscribe to our podcast this only takes a few seconds and helps us get the word out.